guard your thoughts and guard your confession of faith. Would you say that with me? Guard my thoughts and guard my confession of faith. Father, I give you the praise and I give you the glory for your word. Your word will not return unto you void, but it will accomplish that which you sent it forth to do. And so, Father, I just ask that the meditation of my heart and the confession of my mouth would be acceptable in your sight. And I thank you that as I hide myself behind that cross, knowing full well that there's nothing I can do in myself, I just ask you, Holy Spirit, guide me by your, your Spirit and let me say the words that you would have me say. And I give you the praise and I give you the glory. And God's people said, Amen, amen and Amen. Let's turn in our Bibles to Hebrews, the fourth chapter, if we can, this morning. Hebrews 4, and I'm going to be reading from the Amplified Version of the Bible. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Thank you, Lord. Inasmuch then as we have a great high priest who has already ascended and passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession of faith in him. I like how the Amplified adds, in him. Because if you're holding fast to your faith in him, he won't let you down. Now, I'm going to read it again. Let us hold fast. Everyone say, if you would, hold fast. Yes. Hold fast your confession of faith in him. Verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to understand and sympathize and have a shared feeling with our weaknesses and infirmities and liability to the assaults of, of temptation, but one who has been tempted to in every respect as we are, yet without sinning. Watch verse 16. Because, let me say this before I get to 16. If you understand 14 and 15, 16 is just what comes with it. Let us then, because we know these things, let us then fearlessly and confidently and boldly draw to the throne of grace. Say with me, if you will, the throne of grace. Say it again. Some of you were obedient, some weren't. The thro not the throne of condemnation, not the throne of judgment, not the throne of I'm going to get you any moment now. No, it's the throne of grace because of the covenant that we have now, the new covenant through the blood of Jesus Christ. So, let us come boldly to the throne of grace, the throne of God's unmerited favor to us sinners, to us that were sinners, those of us who knew what it was like to be in the world, that came out of darkness into the light of the Lord Jesus Christ, those of us who have a testimony of God's goodness, God's faithfulness. Many have been raised in the church and don't really understand of coming out from the world. But you still have to find your own salvation. You still have to find your own way. It's not your mommy's salvation or your daddy's salvation. The day will come when God will require you to receive Jesus as your Savior. But let's see, see what's happening here in verse 16. Because of God's grace unmerited favor to us that were sinners. See, we were sinners, but by God's grace, we were saved. We were saved, and now we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus because of this unmerited favor that we may receive mercy. I love this. That we may receive mercy for our failures. Is there anyone in here today that's ever failed? If there's anyone that can say, I've never failed, I want to know your name, address, phone number, email, text. I want, every, I want to know everything so that you can help me. 
Because every one of us have feet of clay, and every one of us falls short of the glory. God's unmerited favor is given to us so that we may receive for mercy for our failures and listen, listen carefully and grace to help in good time for every need. I like how the Amplified says this, and find grace to help in good time. See, God's got a good time for everything. If, if, if you're not, you know, you can have a word from God and you have a vision from God and God's told you you'll do this, you'll do that, and you'll do the next. And that's wonderful that you've received that through the Holy Spirit or the word or a prophecy or whatever. But let me assure you of one thing, beloved. God's timing is just as important as the word he gave you. And I'm here to tell you, and I may repeat it more than once, God's never late. We're the ones that are in an instant society. We're the ones that won it yesterday. And I'm guilty. I've shared this with you. When God had the lineup of all human beings for, for patients, I think I was the last one. But the truth is, I'm learning. We don't stay there. I'm trying to walk more patiently. However, this is what he says. Because we are human and we do have failures we will find grace to help in good time for every need, appropriate help and well-timed help coming, I love the way the Amplify says it, coming just when we need it. I like that. Do you like that? Coming just when we need it. So we see in first, or Second Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I've been talking last week, and I'll pick it up for a few moments, about peace. He will keep you in perfect peace if your mind is stayed in him. That's why I titled this message, Guard Your Thoughts, Your Thought Life, because your thought life will become your words sooner or later. So protect that confession of faith with everything you have in you. Keep your mind stayed on him and his words. So you may say, well, pastor, how, how can I stay in that peace? By understanding, beloved, what I just read to you from the Bible. And boldly draw near to the throne of grace. The throne of grace. That's why Paul could write in 2 Corinthians, my grace he wrote what God was saying to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And I've seen this over the last 40 years of my life. I've seen that the lower that I am in my knees, the higher I am in God. I've seen that through my weakness, he's made me strong many, many, many times. And it's just to prove to me and to prove to you, many of you have the same testimony, but it's to prove to you also that he knows, he sees, and he knows our weaknesses, he knows our frailties, he knows all of our little idiosyncrasies. But it's when we can say, God, enough already. I've had enough of what I want. What do you want from my life? What are you saying to me about my future? I've, I've been in the driver's seat long enough long enough. I'll be honest with you. At my time of life now, I've said this many times, I'm, I've lived a lot longer than I'm going to live. And all I want now in my life is the peace of God. That peace of God that passes all understanding, knowing that I'm pleasing Him. Knowing that I have favor with Him. Knowing that he, I love Him and He loves me. And when you have that revelation, beloved, you'll be able to tackle anything. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. So, his power is made perfect in weakness. One of the greatest gifts God gives us is grace. That's the greatest, one of the greatest. He knows we aren't perfect and that we are going to make mistakes. Anybody here? God looks at us with different eyes, beloved, than the ones we use to view ourselves and everyone else. 
It's like he lovingly sees a label across our forehead that reads, room for error. I think I need to say that again. Am I in the right church? Room for error. Amen. You can say amen. Give God the praise because he is giving you room for error. And when you fall down, if a just man falls down so many times, he'll come right back up again because God's given us room for error. We're given that room because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Thankfully, we're not in the old covenant or we'd all have been consumed, beloved, a long time ago. But grace took over at that old rugged cross. Thankfully, we have a God who knows that we aren't perfect and doesn't shut us out when we fail, when we fall. Why then are we not able to demonstrate that same kind of grace to others? Why? Because we're very much carnal. We're very much in what's in this for me mode of Christianity. I've seen over the last 40 years so many changes in the church. And I'm not talking about fear heavens. I'm talking about worldwide. I've saw the carnal spirits come forward. I've seen it. It's, it's very, very per permanent, pertinent. It's, it's real. And we have to guard against what we want. We're, we're Christians by God's grace to lead others to, to the cross, to lead others to God's grace. That's what this is all about. It's not that we can't ask God for things and, and of course, want things, of course. But if you're just all wrapped up in yourself, beloved, you make a real small package. It's just that simple. God's looking for men and women, young boys, young girls. He's looking for this generation to rise up and say, it's not about me, God. I thank you for such a great salvation. I thank you that your grace is sufficient for me no matter what I have to face in life. You'll be there for me just like you were there for the Apostle Paul. You've gave me that room to grow. You've gave me that room to, to, to fail, but you've also gave me the grace to repent. I remember teach, uh, teaching years ago, uh, and it was Brother Kenneth E. Hagan, and he taught about you know a family in, in the church where he was, and and it was just an amazing situation, but he, the end of the story, I won't bore you with the whole thing, but God showed him that this particular family was blessed by God because they were quick to repent and quick to forgive. Quick to repent and quick to forgive. They didn't do everything right. They didn't pay their tithes on, on time. They didn't, uh, you know, take care of their kids the way they, they should have. Uh, and the, well, I'll just tell you the story. There was another family in the church that did everything right and were constantly battling sickness, constantly back, battling depression, constantly battling this, that, and the next thing. And when Brother Hagen went to the Lord and asked, what is going on here, Lord? I'd see this family over here, hear them, scare them, come late to church, da 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 da, da. I mean, everything, you know, the, the other family was perfect. And the Lord spoke clearly to him in the midnight hour when he was before God in his face. And the Lord told him, he said, because they're quick to repent and quick to forgive, that's why they're blessed. The other ones are perfect to man. But I see beyond what everybody else sees. That's how... That's why I love about King David's story, the King David's story, beloved. God, he made all his mistakes. Let's face it, huge. But yet God told him, told the prophet. He lined them all up. David's father was there. The prophet was there. And what did he say? The person I'm looking for is not here. What do you mean not here? There's only one, the run to the litter. He's out there tending the sheep. Go bring him. Bring him here. But he's small in stature. He's too young. He's got all these problems. They're arguing with him. 
This is my transliteration because it did happen that way. And he, they go and they get David and bring him back in. Soon as he walked in the door, Nathan said, this is the man. Huh? And what did he, what did he say to these people that were in shock? Shock. And the ones that we think God can't use, they're the ones that God's going to raise up in this generation and shock the world. Because they're coming out of the dregs of sin and they're going to know how great God is. And what did did the, the prophet say? You might look on the outward appearance. You might judge. But I see the heart. And with all of his faults, God said, this man, this man has my heart. He has a heart after God. And he was quick to repent and quick to forgive his enemies. And if you read some of those Psalms, I'll tell you, David had a few enemies and he was ready to slaughter every one of them. He wasn't afraid of the fight, but he also had a tender heart. And I think that's what God's saying today to all of us. We need to keep that heart tender and give to others the grace that God has given to us. I think that we often fail, beloved, to realize our own imperfections. It's like grace is some kind of a club, and it's only for a select few. And those of us who are in it decide who gets in and who doesn't. That's not how God thinks. The problem is, beloved, God doesn't view grace the same way as we do. His grace is just as sufficient for you as it is for that ungodly neighbor or that unruly person at your work or that person that you're getting on your nerves. Let me tell you why they're getting on your nerves. Because you need to get closer to God to pray for them. (laughs) Hallelujah. Amen. So his grace is just as sufficient for them. Throughout the Bible, as I just said a few moments ago, God used people like King David who slipped from time to time, a lot more than time to time. But he always got right back up again, and he always shouted to God, Lord, forgive me, forgive me. And finally, after time, after time, after time of God trying to talk to him, finally he said at the end of his his whole situation of lying and covering his lie and committing adultery and murder at the end when he sent Uriah out to the front line knowing he would be killed. Finally, God got through to him. And finally, he said, I am the man. Let me tell you what God's looking for in his people today. Those, as we would say in this generation, that will own it. Those that won't pass the buck and always say it's somebody else's problem. Those that will say, this is my problem. It's not what my mother did, my father did, my auntie did, my uncle did, my grandfather, my great-grandfather. And I'm all into generational. But it's not what they did. You remember that old song, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. It's not my mother, not my brother, but it's me, oh Lord. Standing in the need of prayer. We've got to come to the place. And I know little baby Christians, it's just like a baby. God will give them time. A natural child has to grow. A spiritual child has to grow. But beloved, there comes a time in all of our lives when we need to realize the importance of the grace of God and not trample the blood of Jesus. We need to realize this is serious. And God's looking for people that will say, enough of this nonsense. I am going to walk By your ways, Lord, I'm going to listen to your voice. I'm going to listen to what you want for my life and my children's lives and my seed and my seed and my seed to come and spend quality time in the presence of Almighty God. Listen, I'm all into the scared prayers. I've did a few myself. My scared prayer is one word, help. But there comes a time you need more than that. You need to get between the porches and the altars. That's why this church is open every Wednesday night. For prayer. For yourself. 
for your own families so that we can hear God's voice. So when people like David and many, many more in the Bible that made their fair share of mistakes, God didn't remove them from the list of people he could use for his good. In fact, in many cases, he put them right up to the top of the list because he now had them in a broken position that he could use them. He now had dealt with the pride in his life. What do you think is the worst thing to God? What he hates more than anything, the Bible tells us what it is. He hates pride because it was pride that Lucifer fell with. He hates pride. It's right there in the Bible. And many of us think we have came through pride. Really? God's dealing with me with pride practically every single day of my life. Might be just a teeny wee bit here or a teeny wee bit over there, but it's still there. This is a process, beloved. Are you getting in today? You're real quiet. Amen. So, What we're saying here, what I'm saying through the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the unction of the Holy Spirit is God is saying to his church, it's time to come to me. You come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Oh, yes, thank God for people around you that will help you. Thank God for these phone lines. I'm I'm not putting that down, beloved. I'm simply saying it's time for your own relationship with God. Unless you're a tiny wee baby and we'll be glad to feed you the milk that you might grow thereby. But there comes a time when you're going to require some meat. Praise God. Amen. Amen. So he put those people, all those people with all those problems and all those difficulties and all the shameful situations they put themselves in for most of the time, We're we're our own worst enemy. Come on, let's be honest. You know, when we look in the mirror, we can see our faults, if we're honest. If we're honest. So he allowed them to dust themselves off and continue to march forward. That's the good God that we serve. Our grace matters, beloved. But rather than hold on to that grace of God that he's giving you, Give it to someone else. If God's grace is good enough, ours should be as well. So, hallelujah. I believe in Jesus' name that you can hear his voice today. So I want to pick it up for a few moments where I left off last week. We must understand that God's grace is beyond what we can even imagine. We haven't even scratched the surface. So don't let your mind deceive you. Think on these things that are pure, lovely, of a good report. You see, the mind of reason, you remember how I started this telling you about the confession of faith? The mind of reason cannot walk beside on the same path as faith. You can't reason up here and have faith in here. It doesn't go together. Believe me, I've tried it. It doesn't go together. It's either you're going to reason with your mind what you see, feel, hear, and touch with your natural forces, or you're going to reason with your heart and and confess with your mind, Lord, I don't understand everything, but your word says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And then it says faith worketh by love. And so I'm hearing and I'm hearing and I'm hearing and I'm believing that you love me, you love me, you love me. And now, Lord Jesus, I am saying with my lips that I believe. I am not allowing this this mind to interfere with your word. I'm not allowing it to happen. And this is this is where this is where so many of us are. We can we we have to believe this. We've got to believe it. So don't let your mind decide for you. Your mind of reason cannot walk beside your walk of faith. So last time we talked about three things to leave behind in order to be kept in this perfect peace. How many of you want to be kept in God's perfect peace? Let me see your hands. Come on. So what do the rest of you want? 
turmoil. So how many of you want to be kept in God's peace? Amen. I was just taking you that way to wake you up. You okay? So we talked about these three things. One, last week we talked about was unforgiveness. And so many came to me and told me that they were set free by that revelation of unforgiveness. The second thing was, again, a set free moment, was the disease to please. The disease to please. How many of you know we've all had that disease at one time or another? To please everybody, but what you know you're supposed to be doing yourself. Amen? So that disease to please. And the third thing is guilt. But let's finish up the disease to please for one moment before we go to the guilt this morning. The Bible tells us in Psalm 73.1 in the Message Bible, no doubt about it, God is good. This is King David's words. No doubt about it, God is good, but I nearly missed it. I was looking the other way. I, was, I nearly missed the goodness of God because I was so preoccupied with all my problems. And most of the time we have one problem and 99 good things and we miss the good things because we're focused on the one problem. Are we hearing today? Instead of, you know, okay, well, maybe I can't use my right arm, but I can use my left arm. Maybe I can't walk with my right foot, but I can walk with my left foot. I mean, you know, maybe my marriage isn't perfect, but my kids and I get along great. There's always something you can find good if you look hard enough. And, and instead of complaining about what we don't have, start to thank God for what we do have. This is what David was saying. No doubt about it. We, I know, God, you're good. But I just nearly missed it. This is King David. Because I kept looking the other way. Keep your eyes on the prize. His name is Jesus, beloved. His name is Jesus. Now listen. King David almost went over the edge Looking at people. You'll always find what you're looking for, whether it's good or bad. You'll always find what, you're, what you, you're, you're trying to see in someone, whether it's good or bad. Well, my Bible tells me to believe the best of every person. If they let you down, it's between them and God. It's between them and God. Don't pick it up. Don't pick it up. Just let it go. Let it go. That song Disney World came out with was such a hit because so many people agreed with it. Let it go, let it go, let it go. I mean, my little granddaughter had it playing one time in that car over and over. Let it go, let it go. You say, well, pastor, I can't let it go. No, you can let it go. You don't want to let it go. Hallelujah. Praise God. So the ones that really bothered King David were those who broke all the rules and seemed to prosper. Have you ever met people like that? Come on, we all have. It's one of the oldest weapon, weapons in the devil's arsenal, getting you to look at people. The trouble begins, beloved, when you and I try to figure it out. Let me give you a news flash today. God will settle the score. Very wise woman said to me years ago, old timer, she said, Sister McKinnon, God keeps the books. Right, Sandy? God keeps the books. There's nothing, there's nothing that he doesn't know. We think we're in the dark, but he's, not, he's, he's in the light. And he knows what's going on. There's nothing. The first time Jesus came to save us, the next time he comes to reign. And he's going to settle all the accounts. His first coming, beloved, was to take the hell out of your soul. His second coming is going to be to take the hell out of your circumstances. Oh, yes. There's books. There's records being kept. When you're tempted to ask, what's going on here? 
I'm living a good life as far as I'm trying to do the best I can. I pay my tithes. I give my offering. I pray. I seek your face, God. And look at so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. And they're out partying and they're out doing this and doing that. And they don't even care about the things of God. Only with your eyes do you see the reward of the wicked. And King David had to learn, just like we all do, the hard way. Stop looking around and stop judging. Just keep your life right with God. Amen. Beloved, that's where I am. I cannot afford anything else. I can't afford to hold one teeny, teeny, teeny thing in my heart against any human being. I can't afford that privilege, if you want to call it that. It's a curse. We need to get rid of all unforgiveness. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. So, thank you, Jesus. King David's own words. No doubt, I know you're good, but I almost missed it. I almost missed it. So when we're tempted to ask, what's going on? Just remember, the last chapter has not yet been written. Glory to God. John said, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. What is that saying? There will be an audit. But if you're caref not careful, you can de develop a negative attitude in your life and ruin your own future. While you're here, busy looking at everybody else prospering, and you think they're prospering. My dad used to say it this way, follow the half of them home. You don't know what's going on behind clothes, and we're all caught up in what you're doing, and they're doing me. What about me, God? God knows where you are. You keep your heart right with God, and I'm here to promise you what his word says. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Lord, I am with you even unto the end of this age. God hasn't moved. If there's any miscommunication, we moved. Amen. But you can develop a negative attitude and ruin your own career, ruin your own future. You have to understand. You have to understand that you don't have to understand everything. Did you get that? You don't have to understand everything. All you have to do is thank God. Thank God. And if he wants to explain it, he will. David said it this way. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Psalm 73, 16 through 17. What was David saying? When I came and I worshipped you, when I came and I read the scrolls, when I came and I read the word, I realized how foolish I was. Because you will have the last say. Whether it's when my spirit leaves my body, and I'm in your presence, or whether it's while I'm alive here on this earth, you will have the last say. And once he got into the house of God, once he got into the temple, once he got in with God's people, once he heard the word, once he worshipped, he realized how minute his problem was and how big his God really was. That's the key to all of this. Then I understood their end. Just, as, just ask God, beloved, and this is my big one, Ask God to give you patience under provocation and love in the face of injustice. I'm going to repeat that. Ask him to give you patience under provocation and love in the face of injustice. Above all, never let your attitude and actions be determined by other people. Just keep your eyes on Jesus. Just keep your eyes on the prize. He's your source, he's your security, and he is your peace. Now, I'm going to wrap this up in a few moments, but I'm going to go back to the third thing that I talked to you about and the final thing that we talked about last time. 
Finally, we have to set aside guilt. Guilt. When you became born again, the Bible says you became a new creation in Christ Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. And there's one uh, translation that says you became a species of being that never existed before. When I read that, that many, many years ago now, 1977 to be exact, I realized that everything in my past was in the past. Always there's still things that would hurt me today, but still things that would wound me, still people that would rub me the wrong way. You know, like you rub a cat's fur the wrong way, you'll find out whether that cat is happy or not. Amen? And if it's got claws, you better get out of the way. So I'm saying something, beloved. We're not immune to life. But what we don't need is to carry around a heavy sack called guilt. Oh, if I had just done it that way. If I had just not said that. If I had just had more wisdom, oh, why did I, oh, it's getting so heavy. Why did, why did I have to do that, Lord? Why? Why am I so impatient? Why is it that that just disturbs me so much? And then I lose it. And then I feel like I've lost you presence and then worse I've lost my salvation that's a lie from the pit yeah, that's right. or no well maybe I haven't lost my salvation but I sure have lost my witness you don't think I struggle with this I struggle with it every day I can be so impatient I drive myself crazy But I've learned something without going into more stories. I've learned to be quick to repent and quick to forgive. Quick to repent and quick to forgive. So set aside that guilt. Get it under the blood. The old timers knew how to plead the blood. They knew how to pray between the porches and the altars. You say, Pastor, well, sometimes you can be old-fashioned. Thank you. That's a badge of honor to wear. Thank Thank you. you, The old-timers. I was an old-timer when I was 33, when I got saved. So figure out my age. Take 10 years off. Hallelujah. (laughs) Yeah, the old-timers. I'm an old-timer, okay. I believe what the Word of God says and only the Word. I'm an old timer. I believe that I can get in my face before God and he'll forgive me of sins past, sins present, and sins still to come. I'm an old timer, okay. I can get into the word of God and I can say, Father, forgive me. Forgive me. See if there be any sin in me. I'm an old timer. I'll follow up and I'll follow up after that last sheep. I'm an old timer. Jesus left the 99 for the one. I'm an old timer. Yeah, and I'm proud of it. I'm proud of it. I'm an old timer, beloved. I believe that Christians should be walking the walk and not just talking the talk. But I'm also an old timer knowing one thing that I know above all else. God didn't give me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And God is not making me carry two loads of guilt every day on my shoulders. He's saying, will you get rid of it? Get rid of the unforgiveness. Get rid of the man-pleasing spirit. Get rid of and set aside the guilt. The blood of Jesus, beloved, declares that you are not guilty. No accusation that is brought against you can overpower the blood of Christ. He paid the ultimate debt for your guilt. It may take time to heal. When wounds and hurts come into us, most of the time by, by people's you know, words to us, but it may take time to heal. But don't allow guilt. It'll cripple you. You'll never go forward for looking back. You'll never go forward for looking back. 
Hallelujah. So he already paid. My time is up. I'll be closing this up in a moment. Bear with me. He, he paid that debt for you. But that doesn't mean that we're all innocent. We know better. All of us have did things that are wrong. It simply means that we are not going to be called to pay the penalty. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, that's the good news of the gospel. Jesus already paid it. And if I could just close with this thought to you. Don't beat yourself up anymore. I know what I'm talking about. Don't beat yourself up when you don't always succeed. Because the work of the kingdom, beloved, is a process. When you don't give up, you've always got a chance. And deal, and this is important. If I, you don't hear another thing I've said, this is very important. Deal with the faults of others as gently as your own. Could I say that again? Deal with the faults of others as gently as your own. And at any given time, you and I, we can be part of the problem or we can be part of the solution. It all starts in the mind, goes into the spirit, comes out of the mouth. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you look for the good in people, you'll find it. And if you look for the bad, you'll find that also. So, when we change the way we think and look at things, the things we look at will change. Guard your thoughts and guard your confession of faith. I'm done. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Every head bowed, if you would, and every eye closed, beloved. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Father, I have felt your presence in this place today. I have felt your presence. And I know, Lord Jesus, that you love us. But just like any good father, your father in heaven will correct his children with love. With love. Because it's good for us. So today I pray in Jesus' name that you leave here encouraged, convicted by the Holy Spirit, but never condemned. Convicted, but never condemned. And I pray in Jesus' name for each and every one of you within the sound of my voice this day. I pray in Jesus' name you will hear his voice say, this is the way, walk ye in it. And if you slipped in this door today and you've never made a final, full commitment to the ways of Christ, I want to pray for you. It's the most important thing you'll ever do. It's the greatest miracle that will ever happen in your life to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. If you're here today and you do not know Jesus and you would say, Pastor, please pray for me. I've heard this message. It went into my heart, and I need to get right with God. Just raise your hand saying, that's me. Would you pray for me? Anyone, anywhere. I never like to close a service without giving that invitation. And through YouTube also, I know that people hear and they pray that prayer at the end of my message because they've told me so. Is there anyone, anywhere? Thank you, Father. Well, praise God that everyone is saved. So you're here this morning and you heard that message. No one's looking around. No one. It's between you and your God. And you would make the statement to God, Father, I want to be quick to forgive and I want to be quick to repent. And I want to see others as you see them. I want to give the grace that you've given to me to them, Lord. 
Help me, Jesus. You would say, that's me. Let's see your hands. I know they're all over this church. Come on. Be honest. Put your hand up in the air and say, God, help me to make the adjustments that I have to make. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Father, I pray for this congregation today. I pray, O oh God, in Jesus' name, you will grant unto us your great favor. You will grant unto us peace that passes all understanding. I pray, Lord God, for those listening by YouTube, Lord, wherever they are, in a sick bed or, or in another state, that they will also hear your voice. And they will make adjustments to get closer and closer and closer to you, my master. Gentle Jesus, sweet Jesus, we love you and we thank you and we give you the glory. And all of God's people said, amen, amen and amen. Let's stand to our feet.